understanding the multiverse, multi-universe, and the alternate realities actually is something that is from the very beginnings of the Bible. Modern science today in the theoretic arenas where all basis of modern science academics takes their course in experimentation and examination is beginning to understand and look into areas that it's never been able to go before. Actually, uh, in the very beginning of the Bible, we're told about a supreme God who created all things in very simple, very artistic and poetically expressed testimonies written by the prophet Moses as a collection. The Bible is not a collection of scientific detailed descriptions, but rather, in its beginnings, is a very simple illustration of testimonies given as a daily diary of visions and revelations given to the prophet Moses. To translate such understandings into an arena of scientific academics would almost seem an impossible task, especially considering the scale of things being described artistically as a testimony. So we're not going to try to go there, but what we are going to try to do with this short lecture is to consider the immensity and the incomprehensible scale of an all-powerful, omnipresent, singular God. When we consider, first off, what we know, given to us by holy men, of the multi-universe, considering the spiritual realms and how they interact and how they relate with the material composition of the universe, the, the material observable uh, creation around us. Uh, I was talking to an atheist one time who was a professed atheist. I mentioned uh, as we sat outside on a, on a bench waiting to go to a class at school down at Rice in Houston, he and I would get into uh, basic counterpoint discussions before class regularly. I, we were two of the students who would always be early. And I uh, presented to him the complexity of the a particular type of bird that we were discussing, how complex the design was of the bird and how that the bird was able to do control landings and takeoffs with his little feet on a branch of a tree and do highly complex aerodynamic, uh, aerobatic maneuvers using highly complex uh, designs of aerodynamics and all sorts of maneuvers and how such a thing could possibly have happened by chaos uh, as a process of self-improvement through uh, changes of species over time uh, was ludicrous. How uh, to me that that was absolute stupidity to think that such a thing could happen without some program uh, or design put into the genetics in order to enable it to self-improve over time. In other words, my argument was against the idea of an evolution being uh, just a product of chaos or random selection in, in the creative processes. And uh, our discussions like, I went like that every morning. Now, I won't bore you with all that. But what I will say is uh, we were able to respectfully disagree. Um, he was one of the few atheists I ever met that would actually sit and talk with me at length without becoming frustrated or angry and just cutting the conversation off. I... Uh, uh, was impressed with, with the young man's patience. But I will say this, um, 
about atheists uh, without being insulting to them. They're smart enough to talk themselves out of believing in God. And in my opinion, that is a lack of ability to process things in the correct direction and order. I uh, believe that the structure of the universe as we know it, observable, all about us, the many uh, many life forms of Earth that uh, just in this globe that we live on, uh, in, in Earth, uh, including ourselves, is so magnificently diverse and so beautifully in design in the making and forming. Now, I'm going to say that many people take a position that you, you can believe in evolution or you can believe in God. Well, I'll go so far as to say that God could have done it any way he chose to do it in his magnificence, and his, in his complexity, and in his grand intellect. When you look at the complexity of structure and nature, when you look at the delicacy of the balances, when you look at how many variables have to be, uh, shall we say, within a certain envelope of, of position in the structure of life itself for life to even exist, it will convince you that there is a greater entity behind the design of such structures. And we're not talking about artificial structures uh, built by creations. We're talking about structures built into the nature itself that we as beings of development, uh, intellectual beings, uh, build and construct separately as artificial structures. So when I say natural structures, I'm talking about the things that we find that have the program built into them to be what they are in nature, not artificial, such as a building that we as human beings would build. But now looking at the observable universe and considering the sheer size of the universe, for instance, with Hubble, uh, the Hubble telescope, uh, the greatest scientific invention, in my opinion, of our times, uh, we are able to look into the deep field of space where when Hubble was turned to the deep field for its first photographic uh, or fo first optical observations, scientists at all points based on what they knew we're looking into an area of void, just to see what Hubble might see. And to everyone's amazement, they found it burst alive with galaxies. Galaxies far, far further than what man in all of his history has ever even been able to think in his imagination or to conceive of other created such things being in existence. So when we consider that and consider the sheer, if you want to call it size, magnitude of God in such things, it is something the human mind in its finite capacity comparatively is not able to really truly take grasp hold of. I mean, just within the last few Decades have we been able to look at our own solar system uh, by using uh, up the up close observations of probes, such as first with Voyager missions, to where we could actually even look within our own solar system. And our own solar system is nothing more than just a little pinpoint in near space, when we say considering the galactic distances. And that is in our reality of material creation and the possibility and very likelihood of there being multiverses which we are not even able to see or observe or even also 
now becoming more the likelihood than the improbable. So in all of this, we as believers, and I myself being Christian, born again, uh, find this to be all the more glorious thinking about God. But it brings up the question, the Bible, the Bible being a collection of communications from God inspired through holy men of old as they wrote what we are told are scripture. Now, scripture is qualified by being inspired by God. Script implying something written. So being written, inspired by God, by men who were moved upon by the Spirit of God to write those things. So that is first off the biblical qualification for Scripture. But is Scripture an absolute, all-encompassing history, or is it a particular history? Well, I'm going to throw out here to you that it is a particular history. Now, either in either case, the Bible is authoritative, is the authority as being communication from the supreme being to man in either case. But what I want to propose to you to understand that when you're reading the Bible, the Bible was written to man from God. Either in the form of instruction or information or both being combined. Of course, the Bible including many things, poetries, histories, prophecies, instruction, and on a level of encryption spiritually to whether it takes it into depths and levels. It's kind of like a flower that opens up. The more you consider it and read it, the Lord begins to open your eyes to dimensions that no other book on earth that we know of can can even come close. It's it's all on a shelf all by itself. Nothing is like the Bible. It's a living book. It is a multiverse book. It, it is a multidimensional book. It is of extraterrestrial inspiration. We can't confine God to his creation. But yet God created within mankind by miracle the communication of his word to us in flesh. John tells us with the miracle birth, virgin conception of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the only begotten Son of God. There are many sons of God, but only one begotten, meaning birthed in creation of God. He is our hope. He is our life. He is all in all. There is no way to God except by Jesus Christ for mankind. So if you want to know about God, you're going to have to know about God through Jesus Christ. And it is a privilege and honor and a miracle that we are able to do that. And we're going to go into that in some future parts as we explore this. But today, understand the particular history of the Bible. And understand it's more than just history. But I'm going to have to explain it this way. God, being what he is, opened up a opportunity for a conduit of communication from the essence of God and what he, all he encompasses to be able to communicate to a small area in his creation called earth to one particular being, very special, that God desired from the very creating and making of this individual creature, mankind, through a particular line of humanity from Two particular people that were made in a very special fashion, Adam and Eve. And for this, what we will call the biblical people. Now understand, 
we're making a particular statement there. These are the biblical people. Everyone talked about from the time of Adam and Eve in the course of the history of the Bible were from Adam and Eve, these particular two. That means it is a particular lineage in its discourse of generations and that all the peoples in which are communicated to and about with the subject of the Bible are of these peoples through Noah, through Noah's descendants and all. These are called the biblical peoples. Now, did God have others? Well, that's speculative. But we know that from the writings of the New Testament, where it said if all the things Jesus had done had been written, that they supposed that not, all, not even the world could contain the books. So we have to assume that as there are many millions of forms of life on earth, and that earth is not likely by probability formulas to be unique in the universe, even if it were by chaos and random, which we position and state it is not as believers. It doesn't make sense to us that it be chaos or random that created all this magnificence. But it's important for us to understand as we begin to grow in our experience of learning academically, that the Bible is a particular history. It wasn't written for anything other than mankind. It wasn't written for the angels. It wasn't written for the diversity of the heavenly host. And it wasn't written for those not even talked about in the Bible. It's particular. Yes, some of the heavenly host know of Bible content. Some by exposure of millions of years, even the devils, uh, the demons, the fallen angels, having been exposed and interacting uh, intimately and, and against the order of God with mankind, have come to know by experience things in Scripture. The devils can even play games with the wording of God and, and the scriptures, but they don't understand the multidimensional levels of the spirit as it relates intimately with mankind through Jesus Christ. So don't get to thinking of yourself less than what you should. You are very special. You are a special creature. You were intended to be much more than what you were when you were born in carnal flesh. You were intended to be transformed in your experience through intimacy in the Holy Spirit by the possibilities that are found only in faith in Jesus Christ, our resurrected Lord. And it's by that experience that you are able to be transformed to become a creature unlike what you were born to be a spiritual creature, an eternal entity. And all the marvels that God must have in store when this life's journey is finished. But the Bible, as wonderful and multidimensional as it is, brings us to a place, to a threshold, and an opening of a much larger and bigger understanding in the scope of multi-dimensions. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Imagine a specially prepared place by our Lord and Savior for us to spend all of eternity with him. The Bible wasn't written for anyone who ever lived or inhabited other surfaces of other planets. The Bible wasn't written for creatures the Lord may have made elsewhere in the vast distances of his created habitations in other galaxies or even in our own galaxy. The very immensity and size of the Milky Way galaxy itself is infathomable in human scale. And the Milky Way galaxy we know now 
is only a tiny dot in the spectrum of God's cosmos in his creation. And that's only in this reality of dimensional material universe that we are able to observe. What a mighty God. Well, we could go much further with this. But what I'm going to ask you to do is in the simplicity of your faith, absolutely make exploring the places that we can go in your prayer life to live within the habitation of the room of prayer. From the time you get up in the morning, surrender yourself and give yourself to God and say, Lord, open my mind. Let me, O oh Lord, grow in my experiences today to understand more about you. We have only one spirit guide. We as born-again Christians have one spirit guide. That spirit guide is the spirit of truth. That spirit of truth is the comforter. It is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And we are able to be transformed and changed in that experience. I encourage you today to obey Acts 2 to 38 in its entirety. Make that decision to repent. Take that walk of repentance, turning away from sin. And you will soon find that you need God desperately in your life. You need the Spirit of God to conquer and overcome sin in your life. Be baptized in the name. The name is the only way to be baptized biblically. Every scripture, Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, Acts two thirty-eight, and all the others in Acts where they were baptized. They were baptized in the name. Jesus Christ. It is the name, not the titles, where we have our contract of salvation, the covenant. And by going down and taking that name upon yourself, you are signing an agreement with the Savior who shed his blood, that your sins be remitted unto him. Just like putting that stamped letter in the mailbox, remitting that letter and sending it. You're sending your sins, remitting them unto God. And when that refreshing comes, and when that transforming power comes, which you are promised in the word, it says when you repent and or baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, that you shall, shall is a promise word, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And Acts 3.19 tells us that as we continue in our journey, that as we repent, stay in that state of repentance. In other words, repentance is a one-time decision that we continue in daily that the refreshing comes as a result of repentance and forgiveness comes as a result of repentance without repentance there is no forgiveness but the Lord has already paid the price to cover the sins of humanity I wanted to finish with that today in this part and we'll explore more and I ask that you do consider my statements about the purpose and the intent of the communication of the Bible as a particular communication from God. It's not all of it. The Lord actually came in flesh as communication from God. And I am thankful that we also have written communication from the prophets. But remember... The New Testament tells us and teaches us that Jesus fulfilled the prophets. Now we could go many places with that. But for now I encourage you today, be prayerful. Look around and observe God handiwork. And give him glory. For you are his handiwork. And he loves you dearly. Loves you enough to where that he gave his life's blood, suffering, shame, and humility, and all sorts of mistreatment because he loved you. This is Alan Childs bidding you a blessed day. 
In Jesus' name, farewell for now. God bless.